Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing? How many of us are relying upon the promises of God today? God has promised, and faithful is he who has promised, for he will do it. So therefore, we know that he will do it. We sang a couple of songs earlier this morning as love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, but love lifted me. And so, so many times we look at that song, we sing that song, and what does it really mean? Well, this week we are celebrating the Passion Week. This week we are celebrating the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What put him on the cross? I did. I did. What lifted him to the cross? Love. Love lifted him to the cross to die for you and for me. Love lifted him. Or we sang the very first song. You know, I gave it all for you. What did Jesus Christ give up for you and me for 33 years? He gave heaven. He came down here to be a human being, to, to live as a man, go through all the stuff of a, of a human being for you and for me. I gave it all for you. That's what he did. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day in which we celebrate when Jesus goes into his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The only thing is, is that really, was it a triumphal entry? Think about it for a minute. He goes into Jerusalem. You have a multitude of people and disciples that are lining the streets, cheering, shouting, Hosanna, praise be to God, hail to the king, and all of that. My question for us is this, though. If we look at the whole scheme, the whole picture of this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, was it really a triumphal entry where the people were really praising him? Now, certainly it says that they praised him, they blessed him, they hailed him as king, and so forth. But what were they really thinking? They were under tyrannical rule of Rome. And they were hoping that Jesus would, in fact, replace Caesar. Would, in fact, replace the Roman government. Not to be the eternal king, not to be all of that, but to really to replace and to, to lift their society, their nation, their culture out of the turmoil of what Rome was bringing them into. However, you and I know that it was far more than that, don't we? Shane, can you give me Luke 19, starting with around 37 through 41, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing that, that Nate had read to us where they, where they go and they, you know, Jesus tells them to go get the colt and they go and get the colt and, and he even tells them if they ask you who needs it, tell them the master needs it and certainly all of that prophecy came into being. 
But I want to concentrate on this. Where you go down about halfway, and he went, and they spread the clothes in the way. They were spreading clothes and palm branches on the street, for example, and all of that. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen Jesus do. Now, what were they praising him for? Praising him for what God has done for them. Healing the blind, raising up the lame, feeding them when they were hungry and they were gathered there with the fish and the loaves and and all the other great signs and wonders in which Jesus had done. And remember last week, we had even looked at a scripture where it goes and says, now, we're only giving you a small portion of what all the things which Jesus did. Remember, all the books could not contain it and the libraries could not contain all the wonderful things which Jesus did. They were still looking at Jesus for what he had done. There's no indication here that they were looking into the future as to eternity. I find that strange. You see, it goes and it said, all the the mighty works that they had seen. And they shouted and they said, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory to the highest. And some of the Pharisees, of course that was the religious leaders, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, the last part, verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld, he looked at the city, he gazed upon the city, the Jerusalem, And he wept over it. Have you ever wondered why that was put in by Dr. Luke? Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? They weren't listening. They weren't worshiping him truly for who he is. You know what they were doing? They were just giving platitudes. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were shouting, Hail to the King. But all it was was just words. It was really meaningless. Now, there's several reasons why Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. He knew that 35 years or so later, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He knew that. But he also knew that there was a way in which they could have avoided that. And we're going to find out that this morning out of Malachi chapter 1. Now remember, from Malachi into the Gospels, there's 400 years of silence. Let me ask you a question. Why was God silent for 400 years? Was it because of the rejection of Israel? Was it because... So often they would tell God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then they would reject him. They didn't do it. They did it while God was blessing them, but then when things were getting a little tough or things were getting a little, you know, they kind of went their own way. Jesus was looking at Jerusalem and he wept over Jerusalem, not only, I believe, because it was going to be destroyed in about 35 years, 70 A.D., and we know in history that it was. But he knew the hearts of the people that were standing there on the roadside, putting clothes down for, for, for the donkey to walk on, putting down palms for the people to, you know, to brush away the dirt. And he was looking at their heart and saying, you don't mean this. There's nothing to it. Let me just ask you a question. From today, Palm Sunday, to next Friday, for example, that's when some people agree that he died, and there's a lot of controversy on that, whether it be Wednesday or Friday and whatever. You know, from today to the time 
in which he was going to go on trial, what happened to the people? Where were they? They go from crying Hosanna, hail to the king, to on Wednesday, crucify him! Give us Barabbas! By the way, Wednesday night we're going to look at Barabbas and his way of life as opposed to Jesus and his way of life. And society chose Barabbas and not Jesus. Do you think maybe that's a possibility as to why Jesus wept over Jerusalem? Here I am. I'm God. I'm bringing righteousness and holiness to a, to a corrupt society. And you have chosen corruptness. Corruption over righteousness. You have chosen given the polluted instead of the clean. What an amazing thing. You had all this crowd of people on Palm Sunday doing that, and then on Wednesday, which is when I believe he died, on Wednesday, they wanted to crucify him. They wanted them to give him Barabbas, who was a murderer and a very wicked, vile man. Wow. Isn't that the way our world is today, though? I mean, really. If you look at it, Instead of choosing Jesus Christ, the righteous Son of God, so many are choosing vileness and wickedness. Wow. It's amazing. I want to go from here over to the book of Malachi, chapter 1, starting with around verse 6 through 8, and look at those for just a few moments. Because... One of the things that I really am fascinated with, the more and more I read Old Testament prophets, have you recognized or have you noticed that if you read the Old Testament prophets lately, that the Old Testament prophets were not afraid to tell it straight? The Old Testament prophets would not be acceptable today in our world. You know why? They weren't politically correct. They were giving a straight answer. They said the hard sayings that so many people today are afraid to give. They gloss it over. You read the Old Testament prophets and you'll find, whether it be Jeremiah, whether it be Isaiah, whether it be Daniel, whether it be Malachi, whoever, whether it be Hosea or, or Joel or Amos or any of them, you read their writings and you'll find that they did not gloss over anything. They gave it straight. In Malachi chapter 1, we'll find that the prophet Malachi now goes and says to the people, to the nation of Israel, you don't mean it. You don't mean it. You give your offerings and you don't mean it. You give your, your, your sacrifices and it's all meaningless. Let me make a statement and I'm going to make it a couple of times because I want you to hear it. I want you to think about it for a few moments. If what we give to God means little to us, it will mean little to him. Do you understand that? If what I give to God as a sacrifice means little to me, it will mean little to him. Because just, just look at the definition of sacrifice. What does that mean? Doesn't sacrifice mean it costs me something? Doesn't offering mean that it costs me something? I'm offering to God this that has cost me something. Now, certainly we all would agree that, that salvation doesn't cost us anything. It costs Jesus his life. But how about our service to him? Does that cost? 
Or do we do it just simply when it's convenient? Malachi really hits home for us, I think at least, this picture of what was happening on that road to Jerusalem that day when the king was riding into Jerusalem and people were hailing him and people were shouting Hosanna and people were doing all of these things, but they were just platitudes, they were just words. It was meaningless. Give me Malachi chapter 1, please, verses 6 to 8. And that's just an introduction to, to what this is all about for you and for me today. We find that Malachi goes and says to us, by the way, it gives us three pictures of who God is. Okay? Three characteristics of who God is. It's going to give us the picture of God as our Father. It's going to give the picture of God as our Master. And then finally, it's going to give us the picture of God as our King. So you have the picture of Father, Master, King. Malachi is now going to explain to you and me what those three titles or those three offices in which God has in store or God has for himself what he wants from us. For example, what does a father want? You guys who are fathers, what is the most important thing you want? I know what I want. I want love for my kids. I want love for my kids. That's what I want. On my bulletin board, I have a picture of one of my grandkids and a little piece of paper. And written on that little piece of paper with her picture, she gave me, I love you. Now, why would that be on my bulletin board? And she gave that to me years ago. Why is that on my bulletin board? Because you know something? I could not have been given a better gift than that. When was the last time that you looked up into heaven and you said to Jesus, I love you? I said to God, I love you. Malachi goes and explains to us that God as our Father wants our love. Malachi explains to us that God is also our Master. And as our Master, it goes and it says that He wants our labor. What Master do we have? What boss do we have? What is, who is it that we work for does not require us to labor for them? So God as our Father wants our love, God as our Master wants our labor, and God as our King wants our loyalty. These people that have marched into Jerusalem and lined the streets and praised and singing hallelujah and, and praise be the King and all that, were they really showing Jesus loyalty? Let's come to the conclusion of that part. How many people were at the crucifixion? Just a few women and John. Let that sink in. How many people were there when Jesus was crucified? A few Marys and John. Where are the rest of them? They were in hiding. Isn't that amazing? Wait a minute. Just a week before, they were hailing him and shouting Hosanna and doing all of these things. But when the rubber met the road, where were they? Malachi gives us a, a picture of the kind of offerings, the kind of sacrifices 
that the Jew was making to God, the Israelites were making to God, and I have to wonder today, is it the same kind of offerings in which we present to God in our own life? I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be inconvenienced. What does sacrifice mean? That it may be an inconvenience. That it may cost me something. That's what makes it a sacrifice. And if it costs me nothing, then is it really acceptable to God? Let's look at this. Malachi chapter 1, starting with verses 6 and going down through verse 8. And I'll just read those quickly. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I, God's the one speaking, he's speaking through the pen of Malachi, or if you're Italian, you might call it Malachi, but Malachi, it says, if then I be your father, where is mine honor? By the way, the word honor is a very, it's a weighty word. Why? Because what does honor mean? How much weight do you put on that I'm worth? It is a weighty word. <laughs> Am I worth everything to you? I wonder sometimes, how much is God worth to us? How much of, is the relationship in which we have with Jesus Christ, how much is that really worth to us? Malachi goes and says, look, God says, look, I am your father. How much honor do I have? How much weight do I have with you in your heart towards me? I am your father. Where is mine honor? So he's asking a question, isn't he? He's saying, where is it? Where is your love to me? Is it in these offerings in which you give? Is it in these, these sacrifices that you say you're making for me? Is that where it is? And then he goes on and says this, And if I be a master, where is my fear? That word fear means reverence. Do you revere me? Do you reverence me? Do you lift me up in high regard as the one who is your master? Do you do that? And we find this, as saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests. And he's talking to the religious people. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's not talking about the non-religious He's talking about those who, who pride themselves in their religion. And he says, where's my honor? Where is your fear towards me, your reverence towards me? You're lifting me high. And then he goes on and says, oh priests, oh religious leaders that despise my name. You know, instead of despising God's name, we ought to be declaring God's name. Yet these religious people were despising his name. Almost like saying, well, you know, you don't really have to do that. I mean, God said it, but, you know, that, it's kind of immaterial. It's kind of old hat these days. How many people think that the Bible is old, old hat? What God has given us in the Word of God is really meaningless today because that's just old writings that God has given. But certainly society has changed and culture has changed and way of lives have changed. So we really don't have to follow that anymore because that's too old. Tell you what. We need to read the Word of God as something that is brand new and new every day to us. And Jesus, or God goes and says, look, you despise my name. We're going to get into that in just a minute. 
And you say, wherein have we despised your name? Oh, it's almost like a, that was almost like a big surprise to the people when God is saying to us, you have despised my name. Really? How have we despised you? I mean, we've given you offerings and we've given you sacrifices and we've given you all these things. So what God now does through Malachi's writings is he goes and he says, let me show you what you've given to me. Watch what you've given to me. Then he goes, you offer polluted bread unto mine altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, you know, you're saying, oh, the table of the Lord. Well, it's, it's really meaningless now. It, it really doesn't hold the esteem that it used to hold. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not worthy of our praise. Let me ask you a question. In your own mind, define to yourself, what does the word worship mean? Have you got that clear in your head? How do you define worship? Broken up in two words. Worth, ship. So the question is this. When we worship, are we showing God how much he is worth to us? How much is he worth to us? Certainly, just in the songs we sang this morning, we know how much we are worth to him. How much are we worth to him? Everything. He gave up heaven for 33 years. He died a cruel death upon the cross at Calvary, shed his precious blood so that he could wash you and me clean, spotless for all eternity made us righteous in his righteousness. So we are worth everything to him. My question is, is how much is he worth to me or to us? That is what the word worship means. When we come here to worship, have we come here to worship him because he is worth everything? Everything. Malachi goes and now says to the people, look, you have worshipped God with polluted offerings. You have even said that the table of the Lord is contemptible. It's not worth anything anymore. It's meaningless. And then he goes and says, you polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, polluted thee. In what way have we done that? Look at verse 8. If you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Wait a minute. When God told the Jews how to sacrifice and what to sacrifice, what did he tell them they had to sacrifice? That which is unblemished. Let me ask you a question. These Old Testament sacrifices, which we praise God, we do not have to do anymore because Jesus Christ died once for all, for all sin. So we don't have to do these sacrifices anymore that the Jews had to do. But they were to sacrifice unblemished animals to God. And if they didn't have animals, they had to do unblemished fruit or vegetables to God if they were poor. But what were they sacrificing? Look at verse 8 again. What were they sacrificing? They were sacrificing the blind. They were sacrificing the lame. They were sacrificing the dead. And God says, isn't that not evil? To sacrifice to me something that is meaningless to you? Something in which you were going to get rid of anyway? We were talking downstairs during prayer time. It's so interesting. You know, and I've, I've pastored, you know, several churches besides this one. And it's really, really interesting, the things that people give the church. Uh, we don't need this chair anymore. Let's give it to the church. Oh, this chair has a broken leg, but I've kind of fixed it up a little bit. Let's give it to the church. You know, it, it's, 
we're going to get rid of it anyway, so let's give it to the church. Oh, we just cleaned out our pantry, and, and next month this food's going to get outdated, so let's give it to the church. I mean, we're going to throw it away anyway. Might as well give it to the church, right? Isn't that what he's saying? Wait a minute, you have given me that which you were just going to throw out anyhow, which is meaningless to you, which has no worth to you any longer. And then we wonder, why was God silent after this book was written for 400 years? What were they giving to him? Worthless worship. Isn't that amazing? Yet Malachi opens up and says, wait a minute, here I am as your father. Do you honor me? Here I am as your master. Do you labor for me? Here I am, and we're going to see it in just a few moments. Here I am as your king. Are you loyal to me? You're not if you give me polluted sacrifices. You're not if you are taking and giving me that which you're going to throw out anyhow, that which is worthless to you, that which is meaningless to you, that which you will not miss. I wonder today, and and I'm not talking about CCC, but I'm talking about the church in general. Are we truly giving worship to God? Are we truly giving him that which we would miss, that which costs us something? Remember, if it means little to you, it's going to mean little to God. And what are we doing? We find here that he goes and he says, look. He says, it's meaningless. So the first thing we need to do, and you've got, to, you've got the notes in the back of the bulletin. First thing we need to do is we need to recognize the nature of God. And we've already done that. We recognize his nature as being a father, as being a master, and as being a king. We recognize his nature. We recognize who he is. And we are to reverence and to hold dear, to, blow, to, to hold in high esteem his name. Remember, he goes and says, look, you don't reverence my name. My name is meaningless to you. G. Campbell Morgan, a great, great writer, and I have a number of his books in my office, said this, lukewarmness in the Christian's heart is the most defiled or the worst kind of blasphemy. Lukewarmness in the Christian's heart is the worst kind of blasphemy. In fact, if we were to go, and you can turn if you want to there, to Revelation chapter 3, let's see what God says concerning lukewarmness. Or not having a heart that is red hot for God because we have become so relaxed with him that it's meaningless. What does God say? You all know these verses. Jesus is speaking, by the way, to the churches, remember? And he writes, and he says, I know your works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. But I would that you would be either cold, either you're going to be for me or against me. There's no middle ground. How many of us today are straddling the fence, wanting to be on the middle ground? I don't want to offend anybody, but I still want to maintain some sort of Christian testimony. And what does God say? You made me vomit. Hey, I'm just a messenger, people. But isn't that what he says? Watch. You're neither hot, neither cold, nor hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you or I will vomit you out of my mouth. Give me the next verse. Oh, it's 16. Give me, can you give me 17, 18 too? Maybe I didn't give those to you, but that's, that's fine. That's fine. But that's what God says. So, is there any question for you and me as to when Jesus was now riding the cult, 
down the streets into Jerusalem, and people were hailing him as a king and shouting Hosanna and all of that, that he leaves the city, goes up on the mountain, and he weeps for Jerusalem. Why was he weeping? Would it be because he knew the hearts of the people saying, in a week's time, you're going to absolutely disown me. In a week's time, you're going to deny me. In a week's time, you will not be there for me. Yet right now you're saying, Hosanna. Right now you're saying, hail to the king. Right now you're, you're, you're throwing your clothes out in front of me and you're putting palm branches out in front of me and you're hailing me. Hey! And it's all meaningless. Because what is the end result? Remember, we've been talking lately about that, isn't it? You and I need to keep our eyes on the prize. You and I need to keep our eyes on the end result, not on what is happening today. No, we need to keep our eye on the end result. For the end result for you and me, when we know God is our Father, we're going to honor Him. The end result is when we know God is our Master, we are going to labor for Him. The end result is when we know God is our King, we are going to be loyal to him. How many of those people lining up the street on the way to Jerusalem were loyal to him? They weren't. Just a few women and John. Let me ask you a question. Is that the way the church is today? Do we really honor him? Do we really labor for him? Do we, are we really loyal to him? Or is it just simply platitudes in which we give? Well, they know I'm a Christian, or they know I go to CCC, so, you know, I have to say something religious. When in fact, God is saying, look, you're just, you're just laying before me polluted sacrifices. You're giving me the lame, you're giving me the sick. Matter of fact, even one place here we find in, in Malachi where he even says, you go out into the desert and you find a, a, a dead calf and you bring that and put that on my altar. Well, that's worth something, isn't it? Hey, son, go out to the desert and find a dead calf and bring it to the altar. And we'll use that as a sacrifice to God. Yeah, that cost me something. And we wonder, why was God silent for 400 years? Or why, would, why was it that Jesus, after spending 33 years here, he goes and he weeps over the city of Jerusalem? Look at what is happening. Look at what, look what is happening in our, in our world and in our, in our society. Give me First Peter, would you please? Verses 8 and 9. What did God give us? First Peter... Um, chapter 1, 8 and 9. Maybe I didn't give that to Patty. Anybody have it? First Peter, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Whom have not seen you love. By the way, we have not seen him physically, but do you love him? Though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Isn't that amazing? Do we love him that way? Even though we have not been like the, the disciples and the apostles and have handled him with our hands and eaten with him and walked with him and so forth, I know he's alive. I know he's real. I know he's God. And I want to honor him as my father. I want to be, do service to him as my master. And I want to be loyal to him as my king. But we find this that, wow. Here we have God saying, look people, this is what you've done. 
Give me first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. Jesus, uh, Jesus, David wanted to make an altar for God. So he goes and talks to Aluna. And he says, I need, I need materials and I need land and I need all this stuff to, to go and make an altar for our God. Aluna was a great guy. So he goes and he says to King David, Oh, hey, I've got all the wood you need. I've got all the land you need. I've got everything you need. Here, David, use this and give it as a sacrifice to God. What was David's response? Oh, thank you, Aruna. That's very generous of you to to give me all of this and and to allow me to to give this offering and this altar and, and all of this to God. I really thank you so much, Aruna. I appreciate it. I'll take it. Is that what David did? Let's look and see what, how David responded. Aruna looked and saw the king and the servants coming on towards him, and Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face unto the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David says, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. Oh, by the way, that the plague may be stayed for the people. Do any of us really wonder why we're having a plague today? Are any of us really wondering why maybe we're under the cloud of a curse today? Is it because of our offerings? Is it because of that which is not costing us anything, yet we're saying we're making sacrifices to God? David says, I need to make this this altar, and I need to give this sacrifice to, to keep the plague away. I want to give God his love. I want to give God his, his, his labor. I want to give God my loyalty. So Aruna goes and says, why have you come? And David says, why? Because I want to stay the plague. And Aruna says to David, let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be an oxen for a burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments unto the oxen for the, for the wood. And most of us would stop there and say, ah, there he is. I have met the criteria. Aruna gave me all of this stuff and I'm going to kill the oxen and I'm going to cut it up exactly how God told me to. I'm going to let the blood drip out exactly how God told me to and I'm going to build the altar to the exact diameter and, and, and specs that God has given Everything is wonderful, right? No. Because at this point, what had it cost David? Not a thing. It had cost Aruna, but not David. Yet Aruna wasn't the one giving the sacrifice. Who's giving the sacrifice? David is. So watch what David says. Verse 23, all these things did Aruna as a king, he is a king, giving it to a king. Now you and I, and I know some people don't like this term, but I'm going to use it anyway, we are king's kids. But what what are we giving to our father, the king? Oh, something that somebody gave me that I just kind of laid out before God. It didn't really cost me anything, but I can kind of appease him. No, David says no. Watch. The Lord thy God accept thee. Aruna says that to David. And the king, meaning David says to Aruna, no. No. I will not take that as a gift. Why? I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, that which does not cost me what? Nothing. Yeah, but Lord, I laid it out for you, and I, yeah, I've, I've given it to you. I mean, it was given to me, and I'm given to you, and it's a sacrifice, right? What did David say? Uh-uh. 
Why? Because it's cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver, which also, David was very wealthy, still was really pittance. But at least he gave something as a sacrifice to God. Isn't that amazing? So now we have Malachi going and, and talking to us about this, and, he, and he's saying to us, look, what is it costing us? Well, I worship God. It, it cost me an hour and a half on a Sunday. Isn't that enough? Is it really a sacrifice? Well, yeah, because it's a Sunday and I couldn't sleep in. But is it really a sacrifice? What are we sacrificing to God in regards to what he sacrificed for us? Watch another one. There's another portion of scripture here. In the book of Luke, give me Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, please. Watch. Here's a poor widow lady. And he looked up and saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. It'd be like two pennies. And he said, of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Why? If it means little to us, it means little to God. And if I give God that which costs me nothing, what do you think God's going to do? Is that a sweet-smelling aroma to his nostrils? Or is it putrid to his nostrils? You decide. But you have this little woman, this little widow woman, who all she has is two pennies, and she gives it. And Jesus says, of a truth. This widow has cast in more than they are. For all these have their abundance cast into the offering of God. But she of her punity hath cast in all. She of the little that she has has cast in all the living that she had. Let me ask you a question. Which ones are showing love to Jesus? Which ones are showing labor to Jesus? Which ones are showing loyalty to Jesus? The rich people? Or the widow. Let me ask you a question. How about you and me? Are we seeing him as our father and honoring him that way? Loving him that way? Are we seeing him as our master and laboring him that way? As we would our master, our boss? Are we seeing him as our king and being loyal to him? when all out seems to be crashing down around us? Malachi goes and says, you have despised my name. Let me just give you four things that has to do with the name of Jesus. Watch this. In Acts chapter, and you don't have to turn to these, you can turn to them later, you've got them on your bulletin. Salvation in his name. Worship in his name, Matthew 18, 20. Authority in his name, Colossians 3, 17. Prayer in his name. How many times have you gone, have we, do we go to prayer and not say in the name of Jesus? In his name, John chapter 15, verse 16. Let me ask you a question. What is profanity to you? Oh, profanity to me is when I go and I, you know, and I sit with a bunch of people and they're swearing and they're doing all of this and and in, in, in that, you know, what, you know what a real definition of profanity is? Profanity is when we use or name the name of God and do not honor it. So the worst kind of profanity is for you and me to name the name of God but not mean it. That's profanity. Isn't that amazing? Adrian Rogers says, the worst kind of profanity happens in our churches. Think about it. We stand up and we sing. 
Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. But in the back of your mind, you say, man, I wish they'd shut up. I got lunch waiting for me. I got family waiting for me. I got this I got to do. I got this. You know, and then the pastor says, oh, one more verse. Oh, no, not another verse. Oh. That's what profanity is. Singing it, but not meaning it. That's what Malachi is saying to the Jews. I personally think that's maybe why Jesus wept. At least one of the reasons Jesus wept when he was in Jerusalem. Because he saw their heart. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1 verse 14. Let me just give you this. But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathens. You know something? Even, even among the religious, the heathen, sometimes even better worshipers than the religious. Can you imagine that? Malachi says it. Don't shoot the messenger. But that's what Malachi says. Are we showing Jesus Christ the loyalty that he deserves? Do we love him like our father? Do we labor for him like our master? Are we loyal to him? like his subjects ought to be? What a difference a week makes. You know that old song, what a difference a day makes? What a difference a week makes, huh? People were lining the streets, hail him, Hosanna, and all of this, and then just a few days down the road, what were they saying? Give us Barabbas! Crucify him! Kill him! Get rid of him! I hope that's not us. I hope it's not us in our sacrifice to him, in our offering to him, in our love to him, in our labor for him, in our loyalty to him. Remember, God knows the secrets and the intents of your heart. Have you given your heart to him? Have you laid your heart bare before him and said, Lord, here it is. I want to love you. I want to labor for you. I want to be loyal to you and only you. You didn't see that with the people on the way to Jerusalem. And you certainly didn't see it at Golgotha's mountain. I would hope you and I today will give to him that which means much to us so it will mean much to him. Because if I give what means little to me, it will mean little to him. We have to make that choice. I choose, and I hope you choose, to give much of what means much to you so it means much to him. Father, Help us not to be like that crowd in Jerusalem. Given all kinds of platitudes, all kinds of nice words, all kinds of shouting and hosannas. And, but their heart wasn't in it. Lord, this morning I want to lay my heart bare before you. Do I love you as my father? With the honor that is due you Do I labor for you as one who is laboring for his master? And am I I being loyal to you as my king? As your subject? 
are we as a church here at CCC? Lord, help us to be that. Not as the religious people of Malachi's day and even Jesus' day. But Father, help us to see relationally the relationship we have with you should mean all to us. Father God, I ask that you would touch every heart. Draw us ever closer to you. And Lord, especially as we think of this Passion Week, Lord, help us to think seriously about all that you gave to us because you gave your all for us. How can I give any less for you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these that have come. Thank you for this morning. Now, Lord, touch our hearts. Minister to our hearts. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by 